Well, good morning. I want to take just a moment or a few minutes to honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for us. And I want to first honor um, somebody in our family. Um, we actually have, I actually have a great uncle buried in Arlington. And um, but my mom uh, told me this story not too long ago. And I, I finally put everything together. They had a special, um, about a year ago, and a guy wrote a book about the paratroopers that paratrooped, that, that parachuted in on D-Day. I don't know if you guys have seen that behind the lines. And um, my mother was 10 years old, and she went to visit her cousin because he was getting ready to leave uh, for World War II. Uh, he didn't know where he was going. They had told him it was a very dangerous mission, and that's about all he knew. And she remembered two things very specifically at 10 years old. Number one, that he was really scared, and it was unusual. Number two, that he had a stain on his shirt and his sister spent the day trying to get his shirt clean. You know, they're worried about that little detail. And um, so he went to uh, uh, D-Day, if you're familiar with D-Day, and he was one of the people that paratrooped in. Most of those guys who parachuted in uh, were killed, many before they ever hit the ground in terrible conditions. Some of them actually drowned in the fields there that they flooded, the Germans flooded. They were shot down, shot out of trees, and killed. And it was not very much uh, a few weeks later that uh, her aunt was hanging clothes on the line, and see, she saw two soldiers coming up the road and knew that that meant that her son had passed away. You know, we sometimes get distance from Memorial Day, and we think of picnics and all those kind of things. But even when I was in high school, I had a good friend uh, whose dad was missing in action in Vietnam. His whole childhood, as he grew up, they didn't know what happened to his dad. He was just missing in action. I think they finally declared him dead. But when we go to Memorial Day, a lot of times we're thinking picnics and celebration and summer's here. But the truth is, this Memorial Day, all of us should take just a minute to say thank you to the people who went before us you know, on Veterans Day, we honor the soldiers, those of you who serve. But, and I've had several soldiers say to me, please don't honor me on Veterans Day. I mean, on Memorial Day. Honor me on Veterans Day, but not Memorial Day. Because this holiday, this holiday, this remembrance time is for people who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Like, I guess it would be my second cousin who did. And like so many who went before us. So I want to encourage you to think about that and just take a moment to give thanks. And then, and then, I will tell you, these young boys who passed away, I mean, he was 19 years old. 19. Do you remember what you were doing at 19? It wasn't good. Okay, but anyway, um, Bob, we don't want to know what you were doing at 19, so just so you know. But, but the truth is that, you know, many of us, were, and here's the deal, though. Those young boys would tell you, I gave your life so that you could enjoy this holiday with freedom. In China right now, there are churches in China. The government decides who the pastor is. How would you like that today? Would you like the local government to choose your pastor? I'm sure those churches are full. But there are secret churches meeting all over China right now and pastors who are being thrown in jail and killed for their faith. Egyptian Christians were killed just last week going to church. And so you live in a country where you are free to worship. You are in a public facility right now. We pay for this. But you're in a public facility right now, and you have freedom. You know why? Because many gave the ultimate sacrifice for you to have freedom. So don't forget. Remind your children. Remind your grandchildren. And then have a great time. Celebrate. Eat hot dogs and be American. And Think about football and wish that it started already and watch baseball instead and be sad. And, and <laughs> All the baseball fans in here, I just lost you for the day. But, <laughs> but enjoy the day. Claude Mask Jr. is the name of my mom's cousin. And if you go to, I think it's in Selma, but somewhere in Alabama, if you go to Alabama today, you can find his name on a large uh, thing in remembrance of the people who died in World War II from the state of Alabama. He's one of the ones who passed away fighting for your freedom. And so, um, so don't forget that today. Don't forget that today. All right. Well, we're starting a new series, and I don't like this sermon today. 
Because I don't like what it's about. I've never taught on this subject. The sermon is about, is it okay to be sad? Which for guys, we're not even allowed to say that to each other. You, you never, guys, you, you nod with me. Now women, you're, I'm going to just, i got to clue you in. I'm going to help you today. You are going to become uh, uh, more understanding of men. Okay? You would never walk up to a man and say, why are you sad? Women do not walk up to a man and say, why are you sad? That is not appropriate. We do not talk in those terms. Now, you can say, why are you angry? We're good with anger. That actually is the only emotion that we're good with. And so if you ask us how we're doing, we'll say we're mad. And what are you mad about? This thing that happened. And it might be, truthfully, that we're sad, but we, we're not allowed to say that. <laughs> so, so today we're going to talk about, in this series, we're talking about, is there an app for that? And we're going to look at different emotions and the way that we think. And realize, here's the deal, in church, uh, by the way, TV shows actually make fun of this, but in church, we think often that you're to stuff your emotions and pretend they don't exist and just be positive and just think the right things and put it under the blood of Jesus. And we use all these spiritual terms to tell you to stuff your emotions. Jesus did not stuff his emotions. Okay, this is the, the Jesus that carried a whip into the temple. This is the Jesus who wept. This is the Jesus who felt concerned. This is the Jesus who hurt. And so today I'm going to talk about this idea of sadness and tell you it's okay to be sad, but there's a way to be sad, okay? And so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about different feelings and thoughts. So here it is. Here's what I want you to learn today, okay? What is your sadness <laughs> trying to teach you? If you have sadness, did you just have too much sugar yesterday? Did you eat cotton candy, and so today you're like, Ooh. Right? Or did, or did you have a big party and you're six months old and so you're exhausted today, right? Or you were out late last night or you didn't sleep well. Or is there something deeper going on? You have to figure it out. So is there something you need to face and deal with? It is okay to be sad, but God wants you to deal with your emotions and your sadness the right way. And here's the deal. And receive his love and his comfort. Because if you never let yourself feel you also don't let yourself receive God's love. And so, and so we've got to do both of those things. So first of all, here's I want to talk about why it's okay to be sad. And women, for the most part, you're sitting there going, well, of course it's okay to be sad. And men are going, can we talk about something else? And so it's all good. And um, so I, it's really funny because if guys came to each other, so I'm going to give you some tips. This is how guys communicate if they feel like one of their friends is down. Because we don't use the word sad, Right. So, so we might walk up and go, so dude, uh, what's going on? Or, uh, or, or we might say, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or, dude, are you, are you having a hard time? You know, hard time means sad, but don't, don't tell the guys that because then, well, and women, please don't ask your husbands if they're sad. That's not good either. You say, you know, you can say, are you all right? You can say, are you? But if you say, are you sad? That's just, you know, most guys will just look at you like, what'd you think that for? Right? So, and here's what's funny too. Most guys, when they're sad, actually get mad. And they communicate that they're angry because it's the only thing they're allowed to communicate. So if somebody hurts their feelings, you know what they do? They get mad. If they feel kind of down about something, you know what they do? They get mad. They even sometimes get mad at themselves that they don't feel better. That's all. We got one good emotion, and it's anger. We're just, and we're talking about that one next week. But, but the truth is that we don't feel like it's okay so often. But we also live in a society that ladies and men, sometimes the world acts like you just need to numb any emotion that you have. So if you feel sad at all, you need to watch something or do something or take something or drink something or eat something or, you know, whatever to try to stop being sad instead of looking and saying, how do I deal with this? So here's why it's okay. Number one, you need to realize that sadness is a natural emotion. It helps us recognize emotional pain or hurt. It's a natural response to failure. When you fail and you feel bad, you don't get a trophy as an adult. I know, you, you don't, okay? And so even with kids sometimes, we try to make them not feel any sadness. It's okay to go, you know, I didn't do so good today. That's okay. There's days, guess what? There's days you don't do so well. There's days I go home from church and I'm like, that's the worst sermon, like after today. It'll be like, that. all right, number four. It demonstrates that we care. If you don't, here's the deal. When you numb one emotion, you numb all the emotions. And so you, you don't get to choose. And then number five, God uses sadness for our good. So let's talk about how I can be sad the right way. 
And, and I want to just give you an example of how Christians deal with sadness, okay? Or anger or frustration. Most Christians are fake. They wear masks. Most religious people are fake. Jesus actually invented the word hypocrite. Did you know that? So when people say the church is full of hypocrites, you go, Jesus is the one who invented that. It was never used in the context of fake people. It was used in Greek drama. And so when Jesus looked at the religious people and said, you guys are a bunch of actors, that was very insulting. But it was true. And so I was a server at a restaurant. How many, have you, how many of you have ever waited tables at a restaurant? Oh, yes, yes. How many of you, your favorite group were the people after church? That was your favorite? Oh, you people are messed up. You did not have the people I had. Now, there were some groups. I'll be honest with you because I worked with people who didn't go to church. And by the way, a lot of these waitresses I worked with 20-something years ago still are in town. Uh, either as waitresses. Uh, one, of the, one of my friends works at Walmart. One is an x-ray technician. I actually went in and got x-rays. And she said, hey, we used to work together at Quincy's. I'm like, yep, that's how I got this big fat yeast roll. Anyway, so, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so here's what would happen, though, on Sundays. Now, I went to church. I was the only server on the floor most Sundays who also went to church. And sometimes there were people from my church that showed up at the restaurant. And let me show you how they were in church. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. How you doing? Hey, brother. Good to see you. How's it going? Good to... Oh, yeah. Oh, God's good all the time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just a... Oh, just a praise the Lord and Jesus loves you and blah, blah, blah. Right? And, blah, 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 blah. Right? And look at you. <laughs> Buy a car from me or whatever. Right? And then they showed up at Quincy's. Okay? Now, then they sat down at my table. My table? And it wasn't... And they didn't recognize me. So it wasn't... Hey, brother, how you doing? It was, hey, uh, I need some tea here. Hey, can you, could you hurry up on Hey, there's something in there. Hey, blah, blah, hey, blah, blah. and it just, it was, it was never ending. And then, nothing. I don't mind nothing. A nickel, a quarter, something to, I know it was that bad. I would hush too. Yeah, just, thank you for the fake gasp. That was great. So, <laughs> horror of horrors. Anyway, and nothing. Now, this was before people charged stuff. I know it's a long time ago. And, and so people actually left tips on the table. I, I never got tips on credit cards back then. And, and these same people, pretending to have everything together, faked it all. Let me tell you what the world knows and what you need to figure out. If you spend your whole life trying not to be sad, or trying not to allow anger, or trying, and you just try to damp everything down, eventually, like the religious guy on The Simpsons, eventually you will lose your mind. Eventually it will come out somewhere, and your neighbors will know it, your friends will know it, your business associates will know it, people you work with will know it. Why? Because when you fake it for too long, it's like shaking up that bottle and throwing the Mentos in it. Eventually, you are Mount Vesuvius, and you just lose it. You lose it. And sadness for guys is not one that we like to deal with. We like to shove this out of the way, pretend it doesn't exist. But I'm going to give you some ways you can deal with it, and you don't even have to use the word sadness. You can just say, I'm a little down, okay? Or whatever you need to say to make yourself feel better. But I want you to learn to be a real person. Now, now let, me, let me give a caveat on the other side. There's two extremes. One extreme is you shove it and you never, that sounds really bad, you never, you push it down and you never let anybody know anything. Hey, 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 and you're like, I want whatever they have. It's got to be good. I don't know, right? But they're faking it. Or over here is the other person who tells everybody they're sad. Only crazy people tell everyone their emotional state. So if somebody walks in the room and you're at work and they tell everyone at work their emotional state, they're crazy. You just need to know they're crazy. You can love them. You can care about them. But you just need to know that person needs help. Okay, so there's the balance. All right, number one. So feel your emotions knowing they'll change. And this is good news and bad news. Because the good news is if you're here today and you're kind of down, listen, this day is going to pass. This day, There's going to be a day that you're going to feel better. But the bad news is if you're having a great day today, that emotion is going to pass. And it's going to... It's like a roller coaster sometimes, right? There's a, there's a great uh, uh, thing in While You Were Sleeping where, where he says, you know, life is, is, uh, has these good days and bad days like a roller coaster, you know. And I always say, you can hear the clicking. <laughs> With, hey, everything's going great. Right? <laughs> Listen to Psalms 30 verse 5. Weeping may stay for the night, 
But rejoicing comes in the morning. And by the way, most of your fears, most of your sadness, most of your discouragement will attack you at night. It's like a bear or a wolf. They attack. I don't know about bears, but wolves, okay? But they attack at night. And your thoughts are the same way. You find yourself sitting in bed, and all of a sudden you're trying to go to sleep, and all of a sudden what happens? All of that overwhelms you, but know that that doesn't have to lead you. Listen, your emotions should not be the leaders in your life. They should be the caboose. All right? Let your mind be the train. So that means, like, if you get angry, you should be smart enough not to punch that person in the face. You might feel like punching them in the face. You might think about punching them in the face. You might fantasize about punching. You may make drawings of punching them in the face. You may buy a punching bag so you can punch them in the face. You might even put their picture on the punching bag. Don't come by my house, Paul. And, and so you can punch them in the face, right? All of that stuff you can do. But you won't do it. Why won't you do it? Because you don't want to go to jail, right? And here's what I want you to know about emotions. You do not have to let your emotions lead you. Now... With the people you love the most, you tend to do that the most. You let your emotions lead you. So you say and do dumb things that you would never do to anybody else. You treat your dog better than you treat your spouse. Your dog chews up something. It's a puppy. We got a new puppy at the house. It chews up something. And we go, oh, no, little baby dog. Don't poop on my floor. Oh, no, little baby. You got to learn not to do that. But then somebody else in the house does anything wrong, and what do we do? We lose our minds. We lose our minds. We freak out. You dropped a plate? How dare you drop a plate? I've never dropped a plate. My dad used to freak out over everybody spilling drinks at dinner. We had five kids. Every, every night, somebody spilled a drink, and dad, Whoa! you know, now Vesuvius. And then what happened? One night, my dad spilled a drink. What happened? Silence. <laughs> We weren't sure. Did he yell at himself? We weren't sure what was going to happen. There was just silence, and Mom got up, cleaned the thing, and, and a new glass suddenly appeared full of sweet tea. And everybody lived happily ever after. It's amazing what happened. He didn't yell at anybody. Why? Because it was him this time. Listen, don't treat people worse than you treat your dog. If you treat your dog badly, don't give your dog to somebody. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says this. Sorrow is better than laughter, and sadness has a good influence on you. And I had somebody actually use this verse and come to me after one of my sermons and go, you know, making people laugh is bad. What? You need to go somewhere else to church. What is your problem, right? Because, because people, we've almost got an idea that it's a sin. Here's the deal. What that verse is saying that you can learn in pain. You can learn when life is hard. It can help you think about life. Let me tell you something about your artistic friends. Most of us have an artistic friend. They're either good at drawing or music or poetry or, or maybe you don't know they're good at that, but you notice that they, they're just different, but then they also get down a lot. They, they, they struggle. They struggle with their emotions. And let me tell you, some of the best musicians in the world struggle with discouragement. Now, the Bible doesn't separate depression and grief and sadness. We do that as humans, and that's helpful. But the truth is, sometimes that sadness can help you to think about life a little differently, maybe to overcome something. Now, I'm going to say this because on Memorial Day weekend was the last time, 29 years ago, was the last time I saw my father. Because two days after Memorial Day, my dad took his own life. Because what happened is the sadness then became self-absorbed and it became about him. And he gave up. So if you get sad and you can't get through it, and every day you wake up sad, and every day you wake up discouraged, and it seems to get darker and darker, go get help. There are a lot of ways that people help. There's a lot of people that help. There's some great counselors. Get a friend to help. And that's my next advice to you. Listen. Take time to express your sadness to God and a friend. And this, I believe, did you know 22 soldiers a day are taking their own lives? And I think this is one of the reasons. Because they come back and they've been strong and they've been victorious and they're dealing with things that are very hard, but they don't want to let people know it. They want to hide, they want to hold on to it. And there's times that that sadness can actually help you to deal with how you're feeling. And that's okay. That's okay. And so take time to express your sadness. Guys, it's okay. It's okay to be sad. Just use different terms. I'm a 
little down, I'm bummed out, that person's a jerk, you know, whatever you want to say. Number two. Use sadness that, to recognize that people will hurt or fail you. And guys, let me show you that it's okay. This guy, David, he killed the largest man on earth, the best battle guy on earth named Goliath. He killed lions by himself. He actually talked, told the story about he knocked the lion out. He grabbed the lion by its hair and killed it. Can you imagine, like, jumping on a lot, like, whoa, and jump it and kill So this is a tough dude. All right? You would not want to mess with David. All of us would lose. Any of us in here, if we said, David, I'll take you on right now, you wouldn't even get close. He'd just take a slingshot and go, boop, and you'd be gone. That would be it. That'd be the end of your day. He'd be like, I'm not messing with you. Boink. And that's it. You're done. Right? Here's what he says. I am tired of crying to you. Every night my bed is wet with tears. My bed is soaked from crying. My eyes are weak from so much crying. They are weak from crying about my enemies. David, one of the toughest men on earth, had seen battles that none of us had ever seen. Knew it was okay to go through sadness, and he knew who to run to, and he runs to God. If you read uh, uh, this whole psalm, Psalm chapter 6, it's him running to God. Going, God, I just can't handle this anymore. You need to know everyone except God will fail you at some point. Exactly. It, it's going to happen. And, and, so, and so they'll let you down. They won't do what you want them to do. So here's what I want you to do. Remember God's faithfulness when people fail you. Number three, sadness over failure or sin can bring change. I believe this is one of the most important points in this message because we sometimes don't realize that sadness can help someone. If they get sad over their failure... If they get tired of drinking and they get tired of what's happening to their family because they're doing drugs or they get tired of the way they're treating people or tired of how their anger is impacting people or they get tired of how they're influencing life and what's happening in their life and they get sad because of it, that can be the catalyst that they need for change. So don't take away the pain. Sometimes people need to feel their pain, feel their failure. Why? So that they can make some changes in their life. And by the way, we all have those sadness moments. You choose this afternoon. You, you'll go home this afternoon. You'll say, you know, Eric talked about that. And you know what? I, I, one of the commitments I want to make is to go on a diet. And so starting today, you know, you say to your spouse, you make a public commitment. Maybe you do it at a party. Uh, as of today, I will not eat another cookie. No cookies, no sugar. I'm taking a 40-day fast from sugar. I tell you right now what's going to happen. Those Girl Scouts hear that. They hear that from a distance. They could be, they could, they have an office somewhere, and they're listening in. They've got radar, and these girls who don't deliver to homes anymore, all of a sudden, and you open the door, and there they are, Girl Scouts. You got cookies. You got a whole, you got a wagon. I, I haven't seen a wagon. A wagon of cookies. You got Thin Mint? You got lots of Thin Mint. All right, six boxes of those Thin Mints for my wife. She'll see the boxes, but not the Thin Mints, right? So, and then what happens? Later what? You're sad. Why? Because you fail. You, you, you know, even if you make a thing, I only had to sleep at a time, right? And, and isn't that the way they're... By the way, don't ever read the calories on the side of one of those boxes after you eat it, because sadness doesn't come for just a moment then. It's just a long time. <laughs> Listen to this great verse in James about sin. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. You sinners, clean sin out of your lives. You who are trying to follow God and the world at the same time, make your thinking pure. Be sad, cry, and weep. Change laughter to crying, joy to sadness. Humble yourself in the Lord's presence and what will happen? He will honor you. And that means he'll lift you up. So, so let somebody be sad. Let them be sad. Let God let it sink into them. Hey, you know what? It's okay to be sad about that. We, we fail. You know, sometimes instead of just telling yourself, oh, I need to get over this, you need to go, you know what? I really did mess up, but thank you, God, that you're so good. Listen to what it says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will punish us and yell at us and tell us that we're... Oh, wait a second. Oh. Exactly. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that awesome? Not only does he forgive you, but it says he cleans you up. He cleans you up. Ask God to give you sorrow that brings repentance and brings change. That is not a popular message in our society, but it's absolutely true. C.S. Lewis said this. Mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it's more common and more hard to bear. 
The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It's easier to say, my tooth is aching, than to say, my heart is broken. It's easier for a guy to say, I cut my left arm off with a saw yesterday, than to say, I'm feeling down today. Most guys would be like proud. Look. Or look, right? Look, look, right? <laughs> Number four. Here's the good news. When you're sad, you become more like Jesus. Jesus' cousin died. When Jesus saw Mary crying and the Jews who came with her also crying, he was upset and deeply troubled. And he asked, where did you bury him? Come and see, Lord, they said. And then it says, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus cried. So the Jews said, see how much he loved him. I try to remind people when they lose someone they love, and it's painful, that that pain is a representation that you care and that they matter. People say, I don't know why I'm upset. I'm glad you're upset. I hope, I hope there's going to be a day that Eric will no longer exist here on earth. I'll be in heaven. And yeah, I want you to rejoice that I'm in heaven. But I want you to be a little sad. I don't want you to be like, ding dong, the Brookings is dead. Ding dong, right? <laughs> right? Why? Because, because you care about somebody. So it's okay to feel grief. Now, Bob, when you go, that's what we're singing. Just so you know. You know that's, you know that's not true. So here's what you can do. Thank God that your sadness demonstrates love and concern. When you're sad over losing somebody or losing a relationship or somebody that rejected you that shouldn't have or somebody who did something to you that hurts your feelings and you realize that person really let you down or that your sin is really there. Hey, hey, understand that sadness demonstrates that. And then number five, here's the most important thing. Sadness allows us to receive and get God's comfort. So here's the deal. If you never let your sadness sink in and you just ignore it, then you don't get to receive God's comfort. And then you don't get to give God's comfort. Some of you have been through horrible things. Let God use those horrible things to bring you comfort. That even in the midst of that, you've survived. Even in the midst of that, God is good. Even in the midst of that, you can be grateful. Even in the midst of that, you see how goodness can come out of this horrible tragedy. You can see how certain things, not everything, but I can look back after my dad's death and I can see how God has taken us through storm after storm after storm. It's a tragedy, but God used that to comfort people. And now, guess what? I can be sensitive to people that I was never sensitive to. I can challenge people and be there for people and comfort people who could not otherwise be comforted. Matthew 5, Jesus says this, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 2 Corinthians 1, it says this, Paul says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion. Listen to this, the God, listen to this word, of all comfort. He has more comfort than you could even get a hold of. He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those with any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. By the way, some of you won't get healing in those areas until you go to comfort someone else. Some of you, if you're dealing with a tragedy and you say, oh, I just can't get over it, I just can't get over it, it could be that what you got to do is you have to begin to use that comfort and begin to let it flow out of you, and you'll find that God gives you more as you begin to comfort other people. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, our comfort abounds through Christ. Ask God to give you comfort and to help you comfort others. I love that somebody's alarm went off right at 10 o'clock to make sure I knew <laughs> there was a man born in 1809. He fought discouragement and sadness his whole life, but he knew that God had a higher calling on his life. Some days it's said in his biography that he wanted to die. And yet he used that to say, God must still have me here on earth, even though I want to go to heaven because he has a purpose for me. Here's what he said about his struggles. And he struggled a lot. He failed a lot. He went through a lot of things. He got attacked by people a lot. And here's what he, he said. I have been driven many times upon my knees by my overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that all about me seemed insufficient for the day. So he drove to his knees. He was driven to his knees by his discouragement. 
And Abraham Lincoln understood sadness, but he also understood joy. He understood the depths of despair, wanting to die some days, and yet he understood that God had a purpose for his life. And you also. Now there's some encouragement here to how to help a friend who's sad. I'm just going to read these. Don't tell them, don't be sad. I already talked about that. Ask them what's going on. Listen to them. Help them express their sadness. And ladies, once again, don't, don't, <laughs> one of the worst things you can do is, why are you sad? Just stare at somebody, okay? Most guys are going to talk when they're doing something else. When they're distracted by their feelings and doing something, then you can get them to talk. So, you know, feed them and then talk to them or, or go for a drive and talk to them or get them to go for a bike ride or walk. Do something else and then you can talk and then you can use different words. I'm telling you, I, I don't mean to belittle it at all, but the truth is that sometimes you just have to say, are you feeling down? Are you discouraged? You know, those words are okay. Recognize that sometimes sadness is disguised as anger. I'm mad that those people did that. The truth is, you're hurt. I'm mad that this happened. Well, you, you actually might be sad about it. You just haven't got a hold of it. Pray for them. Look for ways to encourage them. If you think they're stuck or depressed, encourage them to get help. Go out of their way to get help, and I can talk to you more about that. So here it is. What is your sadness trying to teach you? Was it just too much sugar last night? Or is there something that you're supposed to learn? Don't let your emotions run you, but know that God wants you to deal with it the right way. Why? So you can receive his love, his comfort, and then you can give it away. If you want to be more loving, learn how to deal with those emotions that you don't like. If you want to be more compassionate to other people, learn to deal with those feelings that you don't like and then begin to say, you know what, God, I know you can comfort me and then I can bless other people. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here after the service. You can come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I know about him. I understood him, but I've never surrendered to him. If you're here today and the truth is you're struggling in this area, I want to encourage you, begin to walk through it. And if you feel stuck, get help. Come to me. I'll, I'll point you to help. I'll meet with you. We'll see what we can do to get you some help because we don't want anyone to be stuck in that cycle of sadness. Why? Because God's given each of us comfort so we can comfort others and be a blessing to each other. Let's go to the Lord prayer today. Father, I thank you. Lord, I, you know I don't like teaching on sadness. And yet, I know that you can use a message, message like this in someone's life who just needs to hear it today. And so, Father, I pray that right now that you would help us to be comforters. Lord, that you begin to fill us with your love for that one today who feels sad and they're overwhelmed. That today, even now, they would sense that your spirit, because you are the God of all comfort, you're giving them your comfort now. Lord, we thank you that even when we feel weak, that you said you make us strong. So, Father, give us your strength today and give us your wisdom. In Jesus' name.